I love it here, have loved it here, the moment I first laid eyes on it. Obviously all of this is the result of a lot of loving care by my wife and um, but this is this is about as close to paradise as you can get. Eric, 24 years on the young and the restless. Will there be another 24 years? <laughs> when is enough is enough? I will stay as long as I have nothing more interesting to do. In other words, if I ever had enough courage to direct my own films and produce my own films, then I would probably leave YNR. You do? Short of that, I won't do that. You have that courage. I know you have. I've met you for 10 minutes now, and I know you have that courage. Now, I don't believe that answer. You could leave tomorrow. You probably have an offer to do a. Well, you, you've been in many movies. I saw you in Titanic a couple of years ago. You probably get offers all the time. Tell me the truth. Why do you stick with that soap opera? Because unless you star in films, unless you have a say over the material you do, unless you are a superstar in films or in nighttime television, this is the best gig in town. I go to work. There's a certain comfort zone, sure. I work with the same people. I am allowed to do scenes that I would rarely be allowed to do in films or nighttime television. Um, I have shown aspects of, of um, my emotional life that I probably would never have had a chance to do. Because when you star in films on nighttime television, you usually are categorized. You, uh, the range of expression is limited. When you came to this country, you were categorized. The only roles you got were playing Germans, Nazi soldiers, mm -hmm. Rat Patrol, the series mm -hmm. that you starred in for several years in the 60s. Mm -hmm. But you broke out of it. If you had mm -hmm. stayed with films, do you think you'd be playing Nazis to this day, or would you have broken out of it? I broke out of it in 1979, 1969, with, with a film Colossus. at Universal with Colossus. You're well informed. Um, at Universal Studios, and that was the first time a German actor had been offered a starring role in an American picture. But my real name is Hans Gudegast. I did the Rat Patrol with that. I did Broadway with that, play with Geraldine Page and my friend Clarence Williams III, and Kurt Jürgens played our father, and I'd done Mission Impossible with that. I'd done all kinds of shows with the name Hans Gudigas. I was proud of it, I'm still proud of it, but Lou Wasserman, who was then president at Universal Studios, said no one with a German name would star in an American picture. That pissed me off at first. But you certainly must have understood it. I understood it. The 60s, after all, was only 20 years after the end the of World War II. The largest ethnic group in America is German. Did you know that? I did not. Yeah, very few people know. Meaning the contributions of German immigrants to this country have been overwhelming, fundamental, substantial. It's being denied because of both world wars. And well, I was, I was, I, I'm, I'll be damned if I have my identity defined by that 12-year period. But I understood his thinking. Tony Curtis was Bernie Schwartz, I think. A number of actors have changed their names um, to anglicize them. So who convinced me to do so was my wife. Wasn't Cary Grant Archibald Leach? I think so. Now that wasn't an ethnic change, that was just, we don't think too many people are gonna buy tickets to see Archie Leach. I think nowadays they would have. Nowadays, it, uh, you can be schmageggy schmagoo, nobody cares. You can be Arnold Schwarzenegger. You indeed can. Let me take you back to your childhood in Germany and ask you, because the bios that I've read about you make me feel like... He is well informed, this guy. Either, either, the, either these bios have been very well crafted to present an image, or it really was your life has been a happenstance. What do you hear from me is real. No, I know from that. the heart, what you read is real, unless someone wrote it that I had nothing to do with. But it sounds like your life just sort of unfolded. And I have a feeling that you have a very strong plan about your life and always had. Did you always want to be an actor? Did you always want to come to America? Or as I've read, did it just happen because you came here, went to school, and got involved in sports and made a movie about river rafting? You're well informed. Is it true it or is, is it? It is all true, totally true. But what's the, what's the underneath? There was what's no, the underneath is 
a belief in myself. And that comes from the world in which I grew up. The first four years of my life were spent under bombs every night. I grew up in the aftermath of the Second World War and the rubble of Germany. Uh, I grew up in a very rough and tumble way where you didn't shy away from using your fists if you had to. I grew up in the world of sports. Uh, became German youth champion in discus and javelin shot put with the team that I was a part of. Um, came from extreme poverty since the age of 12, after my father died. I'd seen a lot of things when I was young. It was tough. Um, coming to America at the age of 18 with 50 bucks in your pocket is not the simplest thing. But from sports, you get a lot of courage. And because you learn to climb over obstacles that are presented to you, put in your way every day in the playing field or whatever the sport you engage in may be. Um, I wasn't afraid of anything, not really. Curious. Did that come just from sports or did it also come from your parents? I think from my parents as well and from the, from the, the, um, circumstance. from the circumstances in which we grew up. How did your dad die? He died suddenly, apparently, as a result of an embolism that he suffered because he had fallen, I think, two or three weeks before in the winter. And he was mayor of the town that I grew up in. Which was called? Um, Bradenbeek. That's hence, your name. Hence, That's your stage hence, name. Hence the name Braden. Braden. But you have an A in yours. Right. Otherwise it would be pronounced Breeden. You're very well informed. So your dad was the mayor of the town. Mm -hmm. Was the poverty that you suffered as a child as a when result he was, of when, the war? When, when he was mayor and when he was alive, we did very well. We had maids at home, we, had, uh, we did very well. When he died, it all ended suddenly. So that's very tough for a teenager or a young kid in any circumstance. How did you handle that? Were you resentful? That's a very good question. And it's one of the most unexamined questions, I think. I think the emotional conflicts arising from a father's early death, primarily that age, uh, are enormous. You grew up with a lot of anger, a lot of drive. Uh, either, it, either you go under or you fight and you struggle. I chose to do the latter. This is with, with Dale, my wife, and my little boy that's up in northern Germany. That's Christian. And that is Dale, and when we were in the south of Spain, I did the Rat Patrol in the south of Spain. And this is, I, I, I did a film in uh, Vienna with Bobby Conrad, it was a, something about television. And this is in a chateau outside, and I think it's so, it looks like a European picture, doesn't it? He's taking a leak in the garden of that chateau. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's something we'll have to highlight. Of course. <laughs> so, very natural about those things. What about your mother? <sighs> when you left when Germany... When I think of what they went through, that generation of Germans, two world wars, they certainly didn't decide to have that war. They, in a sense, were victimized by it. What that generation went through in suffering is absolutely almost incomprehensible. Now, your statement in a political arena would, uh, would arouse, even today, 60 years later, a great deal of rebuttal. Um, I don't give but a you damn know that because I know the truth. Well, but you know that it would, right. especially in America, where so many people lost their lives and in other right. parts of Europe. Right. So many Germans lost their lives during that war. Did well, let me the, ask you a the, tough did question. Did the American boys that were drafted in the war have anything to do with that decision? No. Did the German boys who were drafted to the German army have anything to do with the decision to go to war? No. Okay, well, let me ask you a question then. And I have to ask it. Right. So many philosophers, religious leaders, historians, political people have asked the question of the German people, why did you allow Hitler 
to rise to that level of power and do the things that he did if you truly did not believe it, did not want it to happen. If you had three or four hours, we could go into a very complex history. All is I can there a short answer? Can, is yes, there there's, a short there's, answer? Well, there's never a satisfactory short answer. The only answer I can give you is this. When you allow someone to abrogate and abridge all democratic rights in one fell swoop, when he became chancellor in 1933 and assumed dictatorial powers, invoked what is called Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution, which gave him emergency powers. Whenever some bastard invokes emergency powers, that means he closes down the opposing press. No more freedom of the press. If there's one big lesson to be learned from the Nazi period, is to never allow anyone to abrogate democratic rights ever again. That's the one big lesson to be learned from this. The, what I mean obviously to say by that is, yes, there were Germans who were anti-Semitic. Yes, there were Germans who, who um, were afraid of the Russians, were afraid of communism. Uh, yes, there were Americans who were anti-Semitic, who were afraid of communism. Yes, there were Brits who were afraid of communism, anti-Semitic. The communist element was a big factor in all of it. Precisely, and that allowed that man to then take over. What he would do afterwards, I don't think anyone had a clue. One thing I can tell you, I know this from my father's generation, they didn't want that second war. They had no desire for that war. None. He did. They did not. Let's fast forward. You right. are very involved with international politics with your homeland and also with Israel in the Middle East. I'm told right. that you are going to Israel to be uh, lauded by uh, the Prime Minister. What is all this? Where does this come from and what are you trying to accomplish? As a German of my generation, I feel an enormous sense of responsibility about Israel. I feel an enormous sense of protectiveness. There were a lot of Germans of my generation who went to kibbutziums in the 60s. I played soccer for a Jewish team called the Maccabees with seven Israelis. We won the US championship 72-73. I did that consciously. It was a way to demonstrate that I was not going to be identified and defined by that period. I refused to, because what most people forget is that Jews and Gentiles in Germany get along very well prior to Hitler's rise to power. Very well. Better in Germany than in America or in England or in France. Well, many, That's a fact. There's an historic fact. No, I fact. know that. And I know that many, many of the hundreds of thousands of Jews in Germany prior to the war loved that country. Right. They, they, they considered themselves Germans right. and made great contribution to that country. Exactly. Greatest story in my life, I must say, having raised him. But now it's the granddaughter. She takes that place. That it's is, nice to be a young grandpa. Oh, it's wonderful. It's just absolutely, it's the best feeling I've ever I think ever had it's absolutely unmitigated love. It just, you know, I, I hear that from grandparents. Way. Why is that? I don't know. You Why, how is it different than having your own child? How is it so much because, different? Because you, when you have your own child, it is obviously also a lot of love, but it's also a lot of worries about their future, about raising them the right way so that they do the right things. When you have a grandchild, you just you just love them. That's all. If it's a girl, it's even more so. I mean, it's just. I've never felt anything like it. It's just, it just pours out of you. It's just, just love and warmth. That's all that's doing. Are you politically active in the Hollywood community? Do you participate in... I don't give a damn about the Hollywood community. Oh. I've been my own man always. I couldn't care less. What do you think of Arnold Schwarzenegger, your neighbor? I don't think terribly much about him. Uh, I think he will be, um, um, I think he'll be a better governor than Davis was. I think um, and Davis, to me, was the quintessence of the spineless politician. Why is he doing this, in your view? 
what drives anyone to become a politician? First of all, I think there are two things. Number one, you have a sense of mission. Number two, you have an enormous ego. So what, does, what drives anyone to become famous? What drives me to become... That's my next uh, question. Precisely. It what is, drives it is, you? It's ego. It's ego. It is, it, is, it is not only ego, it is also the conviction that one has something to contribute. You, you, would, love to, you would love to affect people. Why do I become an actor? Why do you become what you do now? Why does this director become a director? Why? Because we want to affect people's lives. That is the essence of art. That is the essence of communication, is to the desire to affect people's lives, to affect change. Are you satisfied with the change and the effect that you have made in your career? No, not yet. What, but I'm very what? satisfied when I go, for example, to Istanbul to Duluth, Minnesota, to Toronto, to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, to, and people just come up and they smile and say, oh my God, that's a wonderful feeling. Is that not a superficial thing? What, don't you no. get tired of that after no, a while? No, that's a wonderful feeling. You never get tired of it. Think of where I come from. I come from a small village in northern Germany. Right? And I can go now to many parts in the world, 150 million people in the world watch this show every day. A lot of people. I once had, I was in Monte Carlo at a tennis tournament, which I'd won with Prince Albert, and we were sitting at a dinner with my wife and my son, and Harry Belafonte came over. He was part of the tournament. He says, would you mind coming over and, and saying hello to these people that love to have your autograph? And I said, who are they? He says, that is President Bugwiba of Tunisia and his family. I said, why do they want to see me? They watch the show. <laughs> Isn't that great? It's a wonderful feeling. I go to Israel and I'm invited by Shimon Peres, the former prime minister and now the head of the Labour Party. I have a 40-minute meeting with him. I enjoyed it thoroughly. He's an extraordinarily bright man. I'm invited to give a speech down in, in Anaheim for Gorbachev, and who I admire greatly. Uh, one of the most important men of the second part of this century, of the last century, was Gorbachev. Gorbachev and Reagan, you know, one of Reagan's greatest contributions was to initiate the rapprochement with Gorbachev, was to engage in the SALT Treaty, the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks in Reykjavik in Iceland. And I think Nancy Reagan had something to do with that as well. I admire Reagan and respect him for that enormously. Imagine what would have happened if there hadn't been this confluence of characters. You have the extreme right guy in America, Ronald Reagan, who dares initiate the rapprochement with the Soviet Union, with Gorbachev. On that side, you have a man who thinks beyond the confines of just Russia, who is wise enough to know that Russia simply cannot keep up the arms race and that it is about to go under economically. And instead of having a paranoid reaction of saying, I'm going to go down in flames and you all go down with me, as Hitler did, this man was wise enough to say, let's engage in talks with Ronald Reagan, a man who is philosophically utterly opposed to me, but as human beings we get along. I have such respect for that. The most important contributions made in the second half of the 20th century, I think, were made by Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan. Talk to me about your family. Right. Tell me about your wife, Dale. We have been married for many years. We've been married since, my God, 1966. Yeah. I've known each other from before. 38 years. So 38 years, and known each other probably for about 42, something like that. Yeah. So if Oprah was sitting here, she'd say, what's the secret of this 38-year marriage? We basically like each other as human beings. We obviously also love each other. Do you have fun? But we also like each other. Do you we enjoy, have great fun. We, of course. you enjoy time with each other still? Well, of course. Uh, I listen to her advice more than to anyone else's. She was and still is a wonderful mother. Um, she is basically a good person. Your wife told me before the interview that because your work schedule is so demanding that mm. uh, you don't have a lot of time to travel with her. You don't take a lot of long vacations. You can't be away. That is so, the one drawback of what I do. So what do you do for fun? What do you do to break the ice to get away? Do you take a short trip somewhere? Where do you like to go let outside ask, of this let me, paradise? Let me, let, me, let me ask you something. You look around. Do I really want to go away? No, I would not have to leave. But, you know, people need to get out of town. Look, I love America. I love California. 
and I love LA. This is about as, in many ways, as ordinary as you can get or as exceptional as you can get. You can have anything here. It's wonderful. I love this town and I love this state. And um, so, and I have a wonderful son and a beautiful daughter-in-law and I now have a granddaughter who is... A new granddaughter. No, oh, Tatiana Marie. And your son is a very successful screenwriter. Yeah. Christian Gudegast. UCLA? A UCLA graduate, yes. Is he working on anything now you want to share he with us? He is uh, doing a rewrite for Touchstone. Does the son quote Shakespeare sitting in the garden? Or is that no, the actor? He, is, that he, the, is that the trained actor? No, let me tell you, that's the trained actor, but it's also, I did one evening of 14 Shakespearean monologues. And I have never been so scared in my life. 14 from nine different plays. A lot of words. And to, that's a lot of words. I have enormous respect for Shakespeare. If, if, if you're interested in finding intellectual jewels, emotional jewels, if you're interested in, in if, if part of your delight is to read and then say, oh my God, you've got to read Shakespeare. When you begin to understand that language, and most directors, most producers of Shakespeare make a huge mistake. They have an audience come in, they presume you know it, and most people are, I say, I, I read Hamlet at one time or another, or sure. And they understand perhaps 40% of what is being said. 30%. 20%. 20%. That is so tragic. Because when you begin to do plays, if you begin to do Hamlet, and you begin to dissect the lines, understand them, and begin to put them in the historic context, you are in awe of that man. I think is arguably the greatest genius that ever lived. He's extraordinary. And when you think of those thoughts, those deep philosophic and psychological insights, and realize that this man put it into poetry, nothing like it. Very few people understand it. You have to be a director, an actor, or an academic to really understand it. So most Shakespeare plays. And even be, then, it isn't so easy to understand. No, right. So most Shakespeare plays should be done by someone should explain the context before, explain some words before, and say this is ba 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 ba, and then the audience would enjoy it so much more. Your top three priorities at this stage in your life are? Make sure that the financial future is secure, is to stay healthy, is to hopefully still do some good. Well, I'm sure that Eric Braden will do a lot of good. And I hope you stay healthy. I know your financial future is secure because 150 million people are watching you. I only ask that as a fourth priority that the next time I come here, and I hope there is a next one, that you have more comfortable garden furniture. <laughs> <laughs> because they are going to have to edit like crazy <laughs> because I have moved around squirming on your chair. But thank you so much. It has been an honor and a pleasure. Well, I have to tell you, <laughs> so I need to work another 10 years to get some, this garden well, furniture. I'm sure they're probably $10,000 a you know. chair. But I have to tell you that um, I have never enjoyed an interview as much as with you. The only other interview that I enjoyed very much, it wasn't that long, was with Larry King. Well, you I know appreciate why? it. Thank you. Because you listen. The secret to his success is he listens. But you ask very intelligent questions. If you don't listen, why be here? You'll be amazed how many people don't. <laughs>